say. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chase Lacaz. I'm here to talk to you about the network uh, model in my fighting game. I currently work over at CoreSoft downtown. It's a kind of a startup company. Uh, graduated from University of Kentucky, not with a computer science degree, strangely enough, but I had Japanese <laughs> minor minor in mathematics, so it's kind of related. Uh, it's really the first time I've done a talk outside of a classroom, so if I stutter a little bit or anything, please forgive me. You're doing good, man. <laughs> All right. Um, so, who here plays a lot of online games? Xbox, PS3, or anybody, mainly a PC gamer? Okay. Um, I know a lot of you have probably experienced what a lot of people call lag or latency with their input and what they see on the screen. So mainly, my talk is mainly about compensating for that. So to reduce the uh, delay between someone's input on their controller to what they actually see and interact with on their screen. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on network models and uh, video games. Three basic uh, forms that I've found doing my research are lockstep. Lockstep is kind of, you wait for input from a remote client, then you iterate to the next game state, then wait again. There is no continuing if you lose packets or anything like that. Um, there's server correction, which is basically a game keeps running as long as it can until the server sends in packets updating its state to the correct state, which the server usually keeps track of. And mix is this kind of obviously putting it together. Um, some of the problems of multiplayer play online, uh, network latency. So packets obviously can't go any faster than the speed of light, so it takes time to travel between client to client, between server to clients. Um, packet loss. So a lot of uh, network code and games use UDP, which does not guarantee a packet to actually arrive at a client. And sometimes it, it actually doesn't guarantee that the packets arrive in order. So you have to compensate for that. Um, syncing. So often one client will run slower than the other client. So you have to compensate for that. You don't want one instance of a game getting ahead of another instance, at least too far. And uh, delayed input response. So that's basically a lot of people who play games call lag. It's the latency you feel when you press a button and it takes much longer for the action to happen on screen than you're used to with a single player game. Okay? Uh, the first thing I looked at, which I'm actually not very experienced in, is StarCraft. Um, this, this, from what I learned, is StarCraft uses uh, the, the locking mechanism for uh, updating game input to state. So the whole game is built on a deterministic model. If you run one, uh, yeah, let's go. If you run one game instance on one client and another game instance on another client and you the same input, both games will still arrive at the same state. Uh, StarCraft doesn't provide any kind of prediction for what the other players are going to do. So it pretty much has to wait for input to come in from the server or the client. Um, for what I've read, you can correct me, uh, but the server basically evaluates everybody's input and sees if it is acceptable and then sends all the input back to the other clients. Um, and for most players, it seemed about the game had something like 200 milliseconds of latency on average. And that's kind of high. Um, now, I think, from what I saw of actual matches online in StarCraft, when you put in a command, your soldiers or I'm not a StarCraft player, will sit there until the server will say, hey, we just got the input from the other clients, now you can go, just so to keep the game uh, states in sync. Okay, next thing I'm gonna talk about is Quake 3. So, Quake 3 is one of the first games that implemented kind of uh, client-side prediction of players. So, it wouldn't wait for the next input state from the server. If one player is running forward, it would keep the same vector and keep going until the server sent in uh, game state update, and then it would correct. Um, the benefit here is that players don't feel any kind of extra latency, but they do kind of experience sometimes jumps. So if you're aiming at one 
character and you thought you hit them, well, once the server updates your state, often you find out that well, you actually didn't hit them. A lot of people complain about this, especially under uh, high latency conditions. And this is the same kind of model you see in games like uh, Call of Duty, most of your first person shooters. Now, Street Fighter 4 is the first fighting game that uh, I'm going to talk about when it comes to network uh, code. It also uses lockstep like uh, StarCraft. It does implement built-in input delay. So what happens is it has an input buffer. It accepts your inputs for a certain number of frames, and then it sends it off to the other client. That way, the client actually has a few frames of input that it can process so it doesn't have to wait on updating the next game state. Um, of course, both clients need to be deterministic or the instances of the game uh, go out of sync. Okay? Now, that is a very common model to implement for fighting games until this guy named Tom Cannon released a, a piece of software called GTPO. Basically, it kind of took the same model that Quake 3 and other first person shooters had for client side prediction and updating the game state from the server, but it uh, applied it to arcade emulators, so like uh, MAME and in this case Final Burn Alpha. Um, basically, what it does is the games will run as far as they can without input, and as soon as it sees that the states are out of sync, it will send the other player's inputs go back to that particular frame that the uh, desync happened and reprocess each input up to the current frame so the game is now in sync. I'll talk about that a little more later. Um, GTPO has been used commercially in Skullgirls if you've ever heard of that game. So that's one of the few uh, console releases that actually uses this netplay. The benefit of this is you don't experience input delay. Okay, and before, actually after GDPO was uh, f first released, Super Street Fighter 4 AC Remix kind of copied the model, so that's really the first commercial game that came out that used this model, at least for fighting games. Um, Alright, I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual technical side of this. Um, first of all, the very simple model of taking input and processing it to get your next game state is this basically. You replay your input, you update the state. You replay your input, you update the state. Now, if you just apply this to network play, well, now you have to wait on the input coming across the internet. So you wait, update, wait, update. So the longer you wait on the input, it lowers your frame rate. So this adds to the game feeling skippy and that kind of thing. So basically, we're trying to compensate for this case. Um, yeah, basically what I just talked about there. Anyway, um, the first thing you will probably want to do is implement your own network th thread, separate from your main thread. So now you have a network thread that waits on the packets while your main game state can continue updating. Um, so basically what you want to do is check your thread using, you probably want to have new text there and lock and read. But you still have the same problem, even if it's a separate thread, because you still got to, you can't go to the next state unless you get the next input from the player on the other end. Okay? Uh, so what we do is implement an input buffer. So when the game starts, we have built-in delay. So the game will read the current state's input. So on the first frame of the game, it will read that input from the player, set that input to an input uh, an offset in the buffer a few frames ahead of time. Then it can send off this buffer to the other client so the client knows two frames ahead of the current state what input occurred. So that basically compensates for packet loss or the time it takes for packets to go over the network. Now this model kind of sucks because you experience input delay. And fighting games are kind of a high twitch uh, competitive situation so you really don't want that. Um, and this is kind of shows you the frames we send over of input to other player. And this shows that we're reading, uh, what, this is shows we write the input to that buffer there on the current frame. 
Okay. Um, and this just shows you the kind of it shows you the actual packet we send over to the other client. So you, what you want to do is you want to send all the uh, input you stored plus the current game tick so they can calculate which frame to read of input. Um, if we can go too fast for anybody, please let me know or ask questions. <laughs> all right. And here I'm just kind of showing you a larger input buffer. But what I want to point out is that we may actually send the future frames that we read with the delay plus frames that we had previously read. What this does is it gives us an opportunity to make it for packet loss. So if one state becomes is slower than the uh, current instance, it can read these old inputs and catch up. If you don't include these and there's packet loss and say the uh, other client was on frame 12, it misses out all these other inputs so it, it would lock up. It would, would not be able to continue. Um, and this basically demonstrates it. So you can see uh, packet at frame 2 flies off, you never get it. But that's fine because at frame 4, you finally get the packet and includes previous input. So then you can just process it and continue on. There is a problem here though. Um, you want to keep the states as closely synced as possible. If one um, game instance gets too far ahead, it's going to be waiting every game update because the other instance is far behind. And so it's basically at the edge of when you read the inputs. So what you want to do in this case is every time that you detect the other game instance, uh, skip the frame or there was a delay, you also want to skip on your game instance or on the local game instance so that the game stays relatively safe. And usually like skipping one update is fine. But if, if you're very far ahead, you can skip again. How, how far back do you send you show the team? So generally you want to send the same amount of, as much as possible basically, but usually if you want to say, send the same amount of frames you have for delay as previous frames. Oh, so if your delay is 15, you want to send at least 15. Right, so if you're staying in sync, oh, sorry, if you're staying in sync, you really don't need to send too many frames in the past because the game's, your current state's gonna wait anyway for the last state, uh, sorry, the remote client to catch up, right? So say that you, uh, or if you detect that you're out of sync by two frames and you wait, you're not gonna process any more frames ahead of time. So there's no reason to even send that many in the past. And this here demonstrates uh, syncing, what we do. So player, I'm not showing you what input player one gets, but if you want to look at player two here. Um, so we can see at frame two, player two is actually looking at the input that the remote pl uh, player inputted at frame zero. Because of the delay, you only need to read it at frame two. And you can see both of them are reading the frame zero input at frame two. Um, and this goes on, goes on, and then uh, right after frame three is processed, it tries to continue to frame four. It sees that the states are out of sync because you see there's a skip in the uh, remote client, so it has to follow with its own frame skip or wait. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the rollback model. In this model, you do not need to uh, have built-in input delay. So what you do is you just keep updating your state until you get the remote client's input. And once you get it all, you can go back and reprocess those game states using the remote client's input and your input to get the current true game state. And what I'm showing here is that player two is processing uh, goes through frame zero, one, and when it gets to two, it had just received the first two inputs from player one, and it reprocessed them. So now after it processed these, both of these game states are now in sync, or it's at the true state. And it goes on again, and at frame five, it reprocesses 
all of these uh, inputs that occurred on the Bruno client for them. So normally on a, on a single player game, mm -hmm. for each frame you'd be processing all the inputs for that frame and then you'd go into the next one? Right. So where you have a history here, does that mean that update that would normally just be what you're doing is actually running what would be a single player update like five times or something that once for each of those? Right, so there? between the current update and the next update, it'll run multiple updates yeah. and then get the true state. So what you end up, oh yeah, I really didn't explain to here very well, is that every time you know that you're in sync, you want to record that state as the last true state. So once you get a few frames ahead and you get the other player's input, you go back to that state, hence why it's called rollback, and rerun those inputs to get the current now true state. In this model, you, you can, you can this basically a peer-to-peer asynchronous model, you don't need a server in the middle. So it's, in my mind, it's kind of a hybrid of that point three and um, StarCraft model. Anyway, uh, basically, these ideas I didn't come up with. <laughs> There's this guy called MovCal I talked with a lot on IRC. We had, uh, had a bunch of discussions, and it led to what my game now has. And, I give all the credit to him, and if you want to check out his readings, he has a bunch of stuff on hacking existing games, this kind of stuff into it. Almost always fighting games, though. And any questions? <laughs> so then, so in the case of a fighting game, like if you were to pull off the projectile with something like frame zero, mm -hmm. and the other player doesn't actually doesn't see that chunk of moves uh, until later. And you roll back to that point where that was first triggered. Mm -hmm. uh, when you run those, say, five updates, does that mean that your game might kind of skip to maybe the, first, the fifth frame of the fireball animation? Right. Like so, yes, you may have fired a projectile, yeah. and then once the uh, rollback occurs, you now have a projectile there. Right. So it happened five frames ago, but now you right. can run that update five frames. So that's one of the, the downsides of this is that you have like kind of skipping. Like there's things you can compensate for that to make things smooth out. You can actually combine the model of input delay and rollbacks. So you can reduce basically the input delay if you add rollbacks, and you can kind of smooth it out. A lot of current games are implementing this, use that. Um, and just like with the uh, delay model, you want to keep the states in sync as you would before, or you run into the problem where you're running to the end of your input buffer and having to you know, resync and it, the game becomes really jumpy at that point if you don't keep the states as in sync as possible. Um, anything else important I should bring up on this? I have a question. Yes. Would you uh, know of any libraries that are already using this type of functionality out there that could be easily added to a game engine or? I've looked for some. There is none. That's uh, actually I started open sourcing some of my. <laughs> let's, let's build one. Yeah. We, I'm, I'm actually open sourcing my code for it. Um, I actually already have a GitHub account. Um, I can email to people. It hasn't been updated in a while because I. It's kind of hard to maintain two separate source repositories with my game engine. And that, but I, eventually I'll upload all of it because I don't think it's really critical for commercial success of my game to, you know. I like giving people my code, so I'm going to put it out there. But yeah, as for question, I don't know what they need. Okay, and then my second, I have one more question. Um, would it be, or maybe maybe this requires some more technical conversation about that at another time, but you know, would it be better to uh, come up with a way to kind of summarize the calculations of the previous frames and add them as uh, Send data rather than, and, and is there a way to avoid some processing? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Are you saying that you want to avoid the amount of time it takes to process all those frames? Yes. To like not slow down the game? Yes. Um, the only thing you can really do is try to keep the states as in sync as possible so you don't have to process a large number of uh, input, inputs. You know? So in my engine, I I keep it down to around two or three frames that you want to process. That doesn't really work so well when you're playing someone on the other side of the Atlantic. So you'll have to probably add input delay for that, that kind of situation. And what you can do is actually ping the other player a few times and 
constantly update how much input delay you're adding and how much, uh, how many frames you'll run before you roll back. And that's just one way to avoid trying to process too many frames. And usually that part of the process doesn't take that long. It's usually just the rendering that takes the most time when you're updating a game. So you don't render each frame, obviously. You only update the game state. So, yeah. And my engine like to process even like 10 uh, frames, or something like that, is less than a millisecond. It's very quick. But I, probably a more complex game, something like StarCraft, that has all these units and all these positions you have to update with the calculations. That might take longer. And then if you have physics simulation in your game, it could take, it could really actually slow it down. So it may not be a good model for this kind of games, right? That's, I think, why games like Quake 3 and stuff, they do that all on the server. So it constantly keeps the, the true state. It doesn't have to actually roll all that back. You just send out to the clients the current state without the inputs. And that's one thing that this might benefit from, is having a server that keeps the true state and only sends out the state and not the input. The problem with fighting games is there's a lot of properties that you have to keep track of, and it may not fit. It probably wouldn't fit in a single packet or a few packets. What kind of data are you sending across? We're just sending them. I'm currently just sending just the player input. If you keep the game states, if, you, if your code is entirely deterministic, that's all you should need. Now, if you're if you have match watching or something like that, and you want to jump into the middle of a match and watch, well, it's not going to work. They're going to have to basically run through all those game, those inputs from the start of the match to the current place. Which, if it's if your game is quick, it shouldn't really matter so much. But that's kind of one downside to it. So you would just get the you know the A button press to send the projectile or whatever, and that goes across, and then because they're in sync, you know that. Okay, that causes this right. to it's happen, and it will always happen that way. Right, exactly. And actually, one of the troubles I've been having with my engine lately, well, when I started implementing this, is a lot of my engine wasn't set up to be deterministic in that way. Like, one thing is you have to be careful of is using floating point numbers, because the, the units on your motherboard may give you different results than another um, computer, especially if you're going between different kinds of platforms and stuff. If you're only writing games for console, it may not matter. I'm not sure if the PS3 and Xbox have a floating point unit or if it's fixed point. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they do. I just want to make a really nice. Right. So one thing I do make sure, uh, sorry, my game doesn't use floating point numbers. I use fixed point. In fact, I just use very large integers. And for rendering and stuff, I just have a matrix that goes in and applies the current position and everything. And basically divides by a thousand on render, because that doesn't affect the game state. But if you stick to the integers, you're, ne you're not going to have any rounding errors or anything like that, unless you divide, and you have to be careful about that. <laughs> Avoid division. <laughs> um, anything else? Any so, I mean, I'm not anywhere in this, but so it seems to me that those fighting games, you usually have two players. That's correct. But could you kind of take the same model and apply that to a different kind of game where you have more than two players? And is there kind of a limit of how many people you can have on that? Because you constantly have to go through those old frames and re -process. Right. So say we adapted this to a four-player game. Now we have four clients that are communicating with each other, setting their inputs and constantly having to update. Obviously, if you have to keep rerunning the frames for each of the other three players, it's going to take longer and they're going to get a lot more rollbacks. So that kind of game may benefit from something more of a hybrid where you have a central server pulling in all the inputs and maintaining the true game state and then sending out the true game state to people instead of sending the inputs. So it, that is one downside to it is that you can't really have many more players. So do many fighting games have four? I mean, isn't that pretty common? It's very, well, it's actually kind of rare uh -oh. to have four people playing at once. Like Smash Brothers does, um, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which is a new game, which actually implements the rollback. Uh -huh. But there's no game, as far as I'm aware, like true fighting game that has more than four players. So this one to be as scalable it would be very scalable to say eight players. You have to you have basically the delay of every single player 
added together. You know. Um, I'm say that the four play ones it's usually two people at a time, and then right. two more switch out, right? So I, I'm actually not aware of any game. Maybe Smash Brothers has it where you actually have four separate game instances playing each other at once. So uh, that's very common in the first person shooter world, right? You have 16 player fan game, you have 32 player fan game. So usually those games implement the server client model, where the server keeps track of the true state and sends out updates to players. So in your game, do you do the combination of the real path and um, the input delay? Oh, the input delay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually configurable in my game. I can set the input delay to smooth out the rollbacks. So the game will, you know, has more frames that it can process where it actually creates the true state before it will actually roll back. And that's kind of, a, I guess, a new thing. Like For fighting see. games, it's fairly new. I'm not aware of any other games that actually has kind of the, has the input buffer where it will run previous frames up to the current state. And especially ones that don't go back and rerun the state to get the true state. It, that's why the model kind of takes from the Quake 3 way of uh, handling multiplayer. Speaking of Quake 3, what about the, um, the client side prediction part of it? Is right. That's okay. why you would not want to put that in to add this to the system as for maybe more accuracy? It has client side prediction, otherwise, you couldn't go to the next stage. So you're you are predicting something. It may not be very accurate. So in my game, what I do is I just duplicate the last input from the player. And it's most of the time, what the player is doing is moving back and forth with their controller. So that prevents you seeing most jumps, right? If I, say, just process the neutral state where there's no input as my prediction, you would see very jumpy movement because the player would move forward, stop, move forward, stop, even though they were actually just holding forward. Um, because fighting games have animation when you press a button that covers usually well, well more than, say, eight frames or longer, usually you don't notice any kind of jumping because during that time, that's when the uh, input's coming from the remote client. And there's, there's no need to really roll back. Even though it is rolling back, you just don't notice it because the game's currently in the true state. I guess I have a basic question. What, I guess, too, what's, what's your game called and like what platform did you develop? Okay. Game does not have a game yet. And I, I'd like to show it off if we could figure out a way to do that here. Um, the engine is called Shoku, which is kind of Japanese for fight. Shoku, say again? Shoku. Shoku? Yes. Um, and currently it's only for PC. It, it runs on Linux and it runs on Windows. Um, in the future, we would like to release it to PS3, Xbox, whatever the next console is going to be. Well, so, what is the code written in? And, uh, do you use any scripting languages as well? Yes, I, I actually I program it all in C++, and for most of the game system, it's implemented in Lua, which is a scripting system. Great scripting language. You, one thing that you have to be very careful if you're trying to make a deterministic game engine is that you're able to actually go back to a previous state. It's a problem with Lua because you can't actually copy the Lua state itself. So you have to be very uh, diligent with keeping track of all your variables, that are at least global variables. And then, so for me, I just kind of have a like, globals table. <laughs> I store all the global variables, and every time I need to store the state, I just copy that table to another table and copy it back when I restore the table. But it's been a kind of a source of problems for me, so I'm thinking about uh, implementing my own scripting system that's better for this. But yeah. And I don't know. <laughs> well, no, it's good for a lot of things, but for my case, it's worked up to now, but I kind of started seeing the flaws in it for online what they kind of thing. Is there Is everybody using Lua then? That's what I hear, all the rage is Lua. I don't know how Lua became good. Is there a different language or scripting language that you maybe use instead? Or uh, there's it's another fun. thing. It's called, uh, I'm actually interested in looking at it right now. It's called. I think it's called Chicken Lisp. Or <laughs> it, so if you know what Lisp is, it's uh, kind of a functional language. But that one is interesting to me because it um, compiles to C. So it basically generates C code. So it would be very easy to integrate into my engine. 
And if I can interface with C, that means I can easily keep track of all the variables and store it and even write it to a file. And serializing would be much quicker than it is with uh, Lua. Which Lua is just an interpreter, it doesn't even have, it doesn't really, it doesn't call any machine code, right? So if you have a lot of your game logic in Lua, it's gonna slow down your game. And it kind of has like an ancient garbage collector too. So even that is not as fast as it could be. Though I actually have read up on a new Lua implementation called, I think it's called Lua JIT. It's actually a just-in-time compiler for Lua. So it actually, on the fly, you compile your Lua code, well, it converts it to a, you know, assembly and it makes real white code that runs on the processor. Uh, there may be one option, 